Okay, so what we're singing here is, uh, these are called uh, subhashyas. Subhashya, the word su means in Sanskrit, just like when you put an A in front of a word, it turns it into an opposite. Similarly, when we put a su in front of a word, it turns it into, it, or it's a prefix, it adds good. So, for example, nirpaha, that's a king. And if you add su nirpaha, which means good king, good king right, a wise king. So, su bhashya is two words. Su means good and bhashya means spoken. So, good spoken or well spoken. And su bhashya is uh, literally about two or four lines. For example, last week we had mateva, kanteva, kirtim, kim kim. That was four lines. In this case, we have two lines. So, hasta, hastaha, that's one hand. Hastau, that's two hands, so that's a pair of hands. So now, why do we have S-Y-A at the end? Because in Sanskrit, we have what's called paradigms. And if we remember these paradigms, that means if you add a certain um, suffix at the end of the word, you change the, the logic of that word. In that case, hastasya, hastaha is one hand, hastasya. So you're adding S-Y-A, that means off the hand. That's called a genitive case. In other words, the hands. The hands what? The hands bhushanam, which means ornament. That's why we call this ornaments. That means danam, generosity or giving. So that means generosity, danam, is the bhushanam of hastasya. That means the generosity of the hand or the hand of... Generosity is the ornament of the hand. Then we have satyam. You know what satyam means? Satyamitya, Satya, Satyam, that's truth. So truth is the uh, Bhushanam, Bhushanam means ornament. Kantha, Kantha means throat. Once again, you add S-Y-A at the end of Kantha, and it turns it into throats. Ornament is Satyam. That means the ornament of the throat is Satyam. Now, Bhushanam, shro, now, Shrotram, remember the word Shrotram? We used Shrotram in one of our verses. Apyayantu mamangani vak prana chakshu Shrotram atobalam indriyani chasarvani means the ear. So therefore, the Bhushanam of the Shrotram is um, the Shastra. We know what Shastra means. Scriptures, that's a very common word, Shastra. And finally, Kim is a question like uh, Bhavataha, Bhavata, Bhavataha, Nama Kim, Bhavatyaha, Nama Kim, Mama, Nama, Dao. That's my name is Dao. So Kim means, is it a question. So therefore, Busha Naihi, Naihi is an instrumentive. Just like if you add S-Y-A, turns it into a genitive. Off the hand, putting an A-I-H on the Bushana, bu Bushanam, it turns it with the um, ornament, what is use? Prayojanam. Prayojanam means use. In other words, in the context of the verse, it means what is the use of other ornaments if the ornament of your hastas, hasta is generosity, of your kantha is satyam, and of your, um, uh, of your ear, shrotram, is the scripture. So that means that subhashitas, Point, they are riddles or they are aphorisms or they are verses called padas meant to provide us a very short and succinct phrase or a teaching in one short phrase. And in this case, what the author is saying is, what is the use of any other ornaments if the ornament of the hand is generosity and so on? What is the use of the, of the ring or the um, how do you call this that it goes around? Bracelet. Bracelet. Mm -hmm. If your ornament of the hand is generosity, what is the use of a necklace if your uh, ornament of the neck is the, tr is the um, uh, truth? And what is the use of the ear? That means we usually put earrings and we consider that our ornaments. If the ornament of the ear is the shastras. So therefore, what is the use of other ornaments if you have generosity, truth, 
and uh, the scripture. Okay, again. Hastasya bhushanam danam satyam kanthasya bhushanam shrotrasya bhushanam shastram bhushanaih kim prayojanam and on practice. Let's practice on practice. Okay. Apyaso na hityaktavyo apyaso hi parambalam anapyase visham vidya ajirne bhojanam visham. Practice is not to be abandoned. Practice is a great strength in the absence of practice. Vidya is poison, just like in indigestion, when the food remains not digested, that same food which was meant to cultivate, nourish your body, turns into poison. So we need to practice what we learn. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvinavadhitamastu ma vidvishawahai Om Shanti 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 May we be nurtured together, may we be nourished together, may we strive together, may our learning shine, may we not quarrel, argue. There is no option for non-action. And the argument is because the awareness, that is uh, satyam, is always pervading the jiva's causal body. And as long as it's shining on the causal body, it's causing the causal body to shine onto the subtle body, which is causing the subtle body to shine and cause the body to move. You see the order? Satyam, causal body, subtle body, body moves in a physical manifested form. So that's why it says there is no option for non-action. That means even if we are seemingly not acting, it is still a form of action. Just think about sitting down on a sofa. We think we're not acting. Well, several things are happening. First of all, the heart's beating. You're losing brain cells because your, heart, your, your brain's not being used. And we're losing muscle because the muscles are not being exercised. So there is no option for something not being done. So, only choice concerning the type of actions you do. And the actions you, quote, you as a jiva that does, as we said, are to be of the nature of sattva. That is, the question comes up. Is what I'm about to do about to cultivate peace or is about to cultivate disturbance or future concern in some way or another? So, now a topic of free will comes up once again. And we're going to address this very, uh, very accurately because it's not enough to say you do have free will and you don't have free will. Yes, that's true, but please explain the details of what that actually means. So now we're going to talk to you about what, what is the logistics that causes you to do what you do as a jiva. This teaching is not about satyam, brahman, it's about you, meaning jiva. Why do you do what you do in the way that you do it? And what this is going to lead to is the development of compassion. Because compassion is not possible unless you understand the mechanics of Ishwara. So now let's tie that in and talk about you as a jiva in terms of why do these actions come about in the most strangest ways and yet we are unable to stop ourselves. Did you ever notice that? We, we know we have a good opinion about ourselves, right? We know what is right. I should be patient, I should be kind, I should be generous. But then we find ourselves in the real world and we totally contradict the very attributes which we stand for and we believe. So, the point of this teaching is to show you why it's actually beyond your control and why you're totally innocent to it and why it cannot be your fault. So now let's arrive to this teaching. Okay, we're going to start by talking about three types of karmas. Because when we say karma, what does that mean? 
and we're going to split it into three categories and see how three karmas are constantly playing out in your life. The first karma is called Sanchita. Now, as the box implies, it's a box and inside the box are a bunch of cubes. Each cube is a representative for your vasana. So that means all of your vasanas are stored in Sanchita Karma. So now, what does Sanchita mean? Sanchita, first of all, is not presently being acted out. So that means if you like to drink coffee, but you're not drinking coffee right now, that's Sanchita. But when you do drink coffee, then Sanchita transforms into Praraptha. So that means Sanchita Karma is a quote storehouse. It's not an official name we're using Vedanta, but just for the sake of simplicity, it's a store of all of your unexpressed desires and vasanas and tendencies, which is why there's a picture of a pot in potential. Just like you cannot see it right now, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have the potential to fructify. And it will fructify because it has to fructify in a physical manner through Pradapta, which we will get to. So, it's a storehouse of all actions in a form of, as I said, cubes, which are vasanas. And vasanas are what? Or let's, let's put it this way. Because of what are vasanas generated? Because of what are your vasanas generated? Yes, because of your actions, which are, which are motivated by likes and dislikes. So every time I apply an action, that reinforces my vasana. Every time I get into something new, the first time I have dark chocolate, well, I don't like that. Let's, oh, that's a vasana, right? <laughs> Let's say I have white chocolate with strawberry cream, and I, and I find that I like it. Instantly, from that moment on, I say I need white chocolate because I've just generated a new vasana. Now, where does that vasana go? in the box of Sanchita. It's my Sanchita Karma. So that means when the opportunity arises next time, if somebody offers me white chocolate, I will say, mmm, yummy, I want that, right? So that's how this works. All right, so that means there are all actions done in your past. So once again, the summary is Sanchita equals all of the actions done in the past have to go somewhere where in your Sanchita Karma. Okay. And what did I say with white chocolate? When the opportunity that is environmental is presented in the right timing and the right circumstance, then what happens is because Sanchita, from the first time I have eaten the chocolate, it generates momentum. Just like when a marathon runner finishes over the cross line, why does a marathon runner keep running despite having won the medal? What's, what's in it for the runner, right? But they just keep going because of the momentum from the previous running. So similarly with Sanchita Karma, every action is leaving a trace, like a glow, and that glow will be triggered based or uh, depending on the environmental trigger. Okay, so similarly with a fan, let's say it's a hot day. And let's say I want to turn off the fan and my friend comes and I do turn off the fan and my friend comes into the house and says, turn the fan off. And I say, yeah, it's off. No, it's on. No, no, it's off. No, it's on. Well, which one is it on or is it off? So I turn the fan off, but the fan's still spinning and it looks like it's still on. So that means despite having stopped performing my action, it doesn't mean that it's still, that it's completely negated, that it's completely dissipated. It still carries a momentum. That is why you have a tendency to do again what you've done before. Okay, so that means that Sanchita now has to fructify as a tendency, depending on the right situation and circumstance, into a present moment now. That's why we have this uh, lovely person who is experiencing a thunderbolt 
Why? What does that imply? Because she's or he is experiencing it right now. So that means the effect of the cause is being experienced in the present moment. Which means that Sanchita is fructified in the present moment. Example, why are you learning Vedanta right now? Does that not imply that you've already conducted or performed a similar operation in the past? I think so. So that means any form of study or education creates a Sanchita, which is why we are helplessly coming back to whatever it is that we do come back to. Right? Because there's a momentum. Okay, so that means that when the body dies, uh, that's when, when, the, when all prarapta is um, finished, then the body dies. Now, it doesn't mean that Sanchita is gone. It just means that prarapta now has nowhere else to express itself through. So that means a new body has to keep, it has to continue the, what, the Sanchita. That's the cause of rebirth. Because where is Sanchita going to go if the person dies prematurely? It has to go somewhere. So that means a new body has to get created for that unresolved Sanchita to keep expressing itself in the physical form. See the logic here? Causes rebirth. Okay, now the next form of ka uh, karma is Agami. Now just like this finger is pointing at one, there's a little knot around the finger. That means already once I have performed something for the first time ever, like white chocolate, the phrase I use, it's coming, baby. Oh, it's coming. What that means is you know what's going to happen. You're going to probably have it again. That means I already have a cord of responsibility or entanglement to address in the future. That's why Agami Karma means it's the first time that you do anything in the present moment. That means it's not part of Sanchita, because what do we say about Sanchita? Sanchita is what you have done in the past. But Agami is what you have done right now in the present moment for the first time. It's generated by your present actions, which then become part of Sanchita. For example, Let's say I never go to the gym and I meet a friend who entices me and I go to the gym and I look at the equipment and I like the, the weights. So I go and try the weights. That's the first time I'm doing it. First, I haven't done it before. First time I'm doing it. What do you think is going to happen now? Because I've done it for the first time, it's going to go into Sanchita. And what do we say Sanchita has to do? has to fructify into the future when the right opportunity presents itself. So you see how that happens? That means first time causes me to, uh, causes that for action to create a new vasana which goes into the sanchitta and sanchitta has to create itself in a physical manifestation as prarabdha and every time I conduct an action because prarabdha means right now, means I'm doing something for the first time and that means a new action is being performed and that new action in the form of Agami is now building a new Vasana in Sanchitta. Sanchitta has to express itself Prarapta. Prarapta causes me to act in the now, first time, because you always do something differently, right? Even though you've done it before. Which causes, then generates a new Vasana, enters back into Sanchitta, and so on. So, here's a good example. Whoever has sex once. Why is that? Why is, if, it's, if sex is so good, why do we have to have it again? It's the same concept. First time we go to the gym, we've never done it before, and, and I was totally fine without the gym. Just like a teenager is totally fine without sex. It's only when they have it the first time, suddenly sex becomes the most important thing of their life. Even though they were completely fine with it before. Why? Because that action has now entered that agami, first time, virgin, next time, no longer, that's agami. Goes into sanchitta, and then when the right situation occurs, a hunk, a hunk, a hulk, whatever it is, or a lady, then the right situation or circumstance arises, and it triggers the sanchitta, and the sanchitta expresses itself as paratha. So, 
what does the jiva has control over then? Think about it. If this is the operation that's happening right now in your life that's causing you to do what you do, then what control do you have? Do you have control? No. Well, no and yes. So, why? Why do we actually have control despite not having control simultaneously? See, it's not, it's not as contrast as black or white. It's always a yes and a no. If you have knowledge, then you're not likely to engage in Exactly. So that means, remember we said about agami karma. This is your friend. Remember, but prarata karma, you cannot help it. You're acting out what you're acting out. You can't help it. Sanchitta, you can't help it because it's done in the past. What you've done in the past is causing you to act out as a form of prarapta today. So that means every time and I am presented with an opportunity for the first time, I can make a choice. I can ask, knowing now that applying this action is going to create, is going to be a gami karma, which stems into sanchitta, the question is, do I want this karma right now to then enter Sanchitta in such a way that it would then later be expressed that would generate peace of mind in a form of prarabdha or it would create a form of distraction or, or cause me to be uh, shaky in terms of my vision. See the logic here? So once again, first time something arises. I have a choice. I can ask myself, knowing now that I can enjoy myself, no problem. But knowing also that that's not the end of it. It's going to have to fructify in the future. Do I want, hence, that fructification to represent a symbolism of tranquility or represent an attitude of, uh, you know, just tamasic and rajasic and workaholic. Do we have control? Now the head goes from here to yes. Yeah. No and yes. So that means from, uh, from the point of view of a jiva, see we don't have to philosophize with whether we don't have free will. From a point of view of Ishwara, Ishwara 2, there is no free will. But you're not Ishwara 2, are you? We're not God. We're jivas. We're mini-gods. So from the jiva's point of view, yes, there is that uh, purushartha effort and there is agami karma. By making a choice, asking, inquiring, will this produce peace of mind in the future or will this cause me to uh, externalize my mind into the world? So that we don't have to philosophize will, whether we have free will or not. We just have to use it. Think about it this way. If we don't have free will, what's the point of the scriptures? Because scriptures are all about exercising our free will. That's the only reason. Their instruction manual, what a jiva can do to go from the state of ignorance to the state of knowledge. Well, no, it's not a state, but to remove ignorance and th that is to, to know thyself. Then what's the point of the scriptures? What's the point of anything if there's no free will? So that means the scriptures themselves are there for the jiva's uh, full exercise of free will. And it is our job as jivas to use that, that privilege of the scriptures. All right. So now let's ask, let's go a little bit further in, in terms of what happens when one gains self-knowledge called Brahma Vidya. Why do we say that when one gains self-knowledge, a wise person, you can call him a Jivan Mukti, that's an enlightened person, Jivan Mukti. Why does that immediately cancel all three karmas? Sanchitta, Prarabdha, and Agami. Why does that cancel all three karmas? What do you think? Who's the one that undertakes karma? Is it Satyam? Or is it mitya? Is, is karma a realm of mitya or is karma a realm of satya? Mitya. So then, who is the one that undergoes and takes these actions of karma personally? A jiva. Jiva belongs where? To mitya. So that means when self-knowledge is fully assimilated, in nididhyasanam stage, that means we've removed all doubts, 
that means we're not saying that suddenly, you know, I, I shot, I, I robbed the bank. The next day, I've gained self-knowledge and suddenly the police people go, you know what, we're just going to leave him alone. That's not what we're saying. The identity from the jiva has been shifted to satyam. So that means, despite things happening or occurring to the body, that body no longer is I. That's, that's as good as saying that's somebody else. See, see, when somebody else gets caught, you go, well, it's, well thank God, that's not me. But, but if you shift your identity to the satyam, then how is this body me? How is this my... So how, how do I care what happens to this body? If this body is no more mine than is your body, it's just another body. It's just another mind. So that means things still occur to the body, but they don't occur to me. Because the me and body are two different orders of reality. I, Satyam, body, Mitya. So therefore, gaining self-knowledge instantly neutralizes karma. And what do we say about when a body dies? The Sanchita has to fructify into the next body. So that means gaining self-knowledge instantly cancels future births in a physical body. Because who is there to get born if I know that this karma is occurring to the body and not me? Yeah, the end of, the, the end, the end of cycle of birth and rebirth, as the Buddhists would say. All right, so... Any questions about the three karmas? So the point of this discussion was to uh, help you as, get to know yourself as a jiva. Like, why do I do what I do? So now, knowing that, is it fair to say that my life, uh, I should be responsible for my life? Keep that question in mind. We're going to get to that very soon. And you'll see that you cannot be responsible. It's, it's, it's actually... If you quantify Ishwara, it's impossible to be responsible. Offloading what? What, what, what is a Jiva's anxiety all about? My, my duty, my responsibility, I need to deal with this. That's what Jiva, because Jiva thinks I'm separate from the world, therefore it's my fault. So we're going to arrive how we actually cannot be a fault. All right. So only the type of actions you do. Now we discussed this, the Agami Karma, remember? Choice. There is also no choice of results because you are not the author of the results. You, Jiva, are not the author of the results. Who is the author? Ishwara. Okay, so now let's learn about what Ishwara is. And I'm going to give you this from the highest and then from the Jiva's point of view. What is God? Ishwara 1, let's put it from Ishwara 2 point of view. Ishwara 2 is when Ishwara 1 expresses its two powers, knowledge and power. Think about when you dream. You in the bed are dreaming. Well, you're not dreaming yet, but you're in the bed. What happens a few minutes later? A dream comes up. So that means what? The dream is what? The dream is creation. And where did this creation come from? What was the cause of this creation? The dreamer. You in bed. What is the dream made out of? Knowledge and substance. To whom does the knowledge belong to? The dreamer. To whom does the substance belong to of the dream? To the dreamer. Because the dream comes out of you. Does the dream come out of somebody else? No, you dream. So that means it's your dream. That means the dreamer is what? In this context, Ishwara 1. When in context or in reference to the dream, when the dream pops up, that's when we call Ishwara 2. That means the dormant power of 
knowledge and substance in me, the dreamer, when that dormant power of knowledge and substance is expressed as a dream, we call that Ishwara 2. Dreamer Ishwara 1, dreamer, the dream Ishwara 2. Clear? Where does the knowledge of the dream come from? The, you, the dreamer. That means all characters and all of the buildings and everything in the dream that you have comes from where? You, because you're the one that's dreaming the dream. Where does the substance of the characters come from? Out of you. Without you dreaming, the dream cannot be. That means, they come, that means both knowledge and substance comes out of you. Now, what happens in a dream? That means creation. We have different characters, don't we? And what are the characters doing? They're arguing who's right, uh, whose system is better. Some of the Advaita Vedanta, Buddhism, you got, you know, Christianity. They're all fighting about who's right or wrong. Who's dreaming the dream? Or out of what is every character in that dream off? You, the dreamer. Without the dreamer, there is no dream. So that means every character is having an own individual identity, separate, seemingly separate from everyone else. They're all fighting, talking, experiencing, and yet all of them fail to recognize that they all come from the one same dreamer. That means the entire world of creation, Ishwara 2, is what? An express a power in Ishwara 1, in you, in Satya. So that means the question arises, what is Ishwara 2? What is God? What is creation? Creation is when Ishwara 1 or let's say a role that Ishwara 1 plays when Maya is operating. What is Maya? All knowledge, all power. That means when you sleep, all knowledge, all power, that's Maya in potential. When you begin to dream, that Maya turns into Ishwara 2. That means Maya is potential, unexpressed. Once that potential of all knowledge, all power is expressed, we call that Ishwara 2. Role Ishwara 1 plays. Just like, you know, um, uh, the Greeks, you know, in, in uh, the Halloween parties when people put a mask on. So, and so they're pretending to be somebody else who they're not. They know they're pretending. They know that's not them. They know there's, a there's, there's, there's me behind this mask. Similarly, Ishwara 2 is when Ishwara 1, when Satyam, when Brahman plays a role when Maya is operating in manifest form known as Ishwara 2. Clear so far? All right. Or another way to say this is Ishwara 1 is... That means Brahman is um, when Ishwara 2 is when Ishwara 1, Ishwara 1 is wielding Maya. Ishwara 1 wielding Maya is Ishwara 2. Just like a dreamer wielding the dream is creation. Similarly, Ishwara 1, Brahman wielding its power of Maya is creation or Ishwara 2. Are we 100% clear on this or we need more explanation? Because we're going to get into more explanation anyway. Okay. It's an impersonal principle that facilitates Jiva's actions. Think about it this way. If I say hi to you, you're obligated to respond, aren't you? You're an expression of Ishwara. I just made Ishwara respond back. 
That's why we say karma paladata, the facilitator of jiva's actions. That's where free will comes up. When you apply the right appropriate action, then Ishwara too is obligated to respond back according to the action which you have put out into the field. So the question is, what kind of action do you want to put out into the field? Is it one that brings back a result of the side of the negative or the one that brings a side of the positive? It's all up to you. That means that Ishwara is nothing, Ishwara 2 is nothing but a facilitator of jivas, of your actions. If I put a gun to someone's head, guess what? Ishwara is obligated to respond. Oh, here's my money. You see? So that means that uh, Jiva is, that Ishwara 2 is simply a power that provides the Jiva results of the Jiva's action. It's an impersonal power. All right, so it's a function in consciousness. So Ishwara 2 is a function or a power in consciousness. Just like a dream is a power in the dreamer, similarly Ishwara 2 is a power in um, Ishwara 1, which is called Maya. So that means uh, it projects all names and forms. That's where we and that's why we have all names and forms. Because Ishwara 2, just like in a dream, it creates differences. It creates different characters, it creates different colors, it creates different... Uh, orders of rules, and then for that, in order to work in that reality, we have to give it name and form. Now, question. Does that then imply that Ishwara 1 is responsible for creation? Because now, because now we have a problem. We would say that a murder is Ishwara 1's fault. No. Look at it this way. Are you responsible for anything that is you? You means consciousness. Are you consciousness responsible for anything that happens in this world? Did you cause this world consciousness? See, it's a little tricky one because on one hand, a dreamer in the bed has the power to invoke the dream. But does the dreamer invoke the dream? or the dream occurs by itself without your interference. Think about it. Who goes to bed and goes, I'm going to now begin dreaming in five, four, three, two, one, poof, the dream occurs. Who does that? No one. You're completely innocent. This power is in you and yet you do not cause this power. So it's a yes and a no. In, in other words, that's why they say Ishwara 1 is a causeless cause. It caused it, but it didn't cause it. You caused the dream, but you actually didn't cause the dream. Causeless cause. Now, uh, does Ishwara 2 know about Ishwara 1? That's a question. Does Ishwara 2 know about Ishwara 1? Does Ishwara 2, everything underneath the line, know about Ishwara 1? Well, the question is, is, is not entirely correct because what do we say about Ishwara 1? Where, where is here Wu where you cannot find? Ishwara 1 pervades Ishwara 2. They are one and the same. Jumper Wu, where is the difference? Reality is non-dual. So that means the question of whether Ishwara 2 knows about Ishwara 1 doesn't really apply. That's a trick question. Because Ishwara, there is only Brahman here. There is only consciousness. Yeah. Okay, so what else is Ishwara 2? Ishwara 2 is the sum total of all knowledge, as we just said. Where does all of this knowledge about the world come from? Where do you get... You know, how do you, you, why does hair grow so long? Why does the grass stop growing at such a length? What tells the trees to grow branches in a certain configuration? Why does the sun rise in the east and set in the west? Why do we have, you know, the, the, why do we have the five elements? Why do we have wind, fire? Who creates the, the, the mechanics? Who creates the laws? Where does all this come from? Did, did any of us create this? No, no. 
So Ishwara 2 is all knowledge. Knowledge which creates the entire dream. But it is not your knowledge. Just like the dreamer, just like the dream, even though it is all knowledge and all power, you did not cause that. It's a potential. It only becomes Ishwara 2 creation in, re in reference to the dream. When the dream is absent, there, there is no, what power? It's just potential. But there is no power. It's only known when the power is expressed. Just like if you never ever dream in your life, would you ever know that you're actually capable of dreaming? No. So that means creation is only known when creation is manifest. When creation is not manifest, then the, all that remains is existence, Ishwara 1. Okay. So that means even a jnani, a jnani is an enlightened person, even a jnani does not have access to Ishwara, to all knowledge. And we're saying this because there's a common... Um, it's, it's, it goes around in an implied meaning that some gurus will imply they know everything, they have access to Ishwara. This is not true. Only Ishwara 2 has access to Ishwara 2. A jiva only has access to what a jiva has. But it does not matter. Because what, what pervades both Ishwara 2 and the jiva? What pervades that? Consciousness. Uh, you whispered it. I heard you. That means all a jiva has to know is the one, the one principle which pervades the entire existence, which is existence itself, consciousness. That means you don't have to know about individual, individual particularities. You just have to know that one substance, that one wall, because of which every form is made. When we get to Chandogya Upanishad, we'll explain this very accurately with the pot and clay example. Uh, between Shweta Ketu and Udalaka, it's coming up very soon. It's going to be very helpful to understand that uh, how you can actually know one principle and knowing that one principle, all is known. You can know one principle and the unheard of becomes the heard. Knowing one principle, the unseen becomes the seen. Knowing one principle, the uncognized becomes the cognized. We'll explain that. Okie dokie. Now, in the context of the text of the Bhagavad Gita, where we are, chapter 2, we're not coming back to the Jiva. We talked what Ishwara is on, the, on a higher level, so now we're going to bring it back down to the Jiva level. Ishwara 2 doesn't care what Jiva thinks or feels, only what a Jiva does, because we just explained karma paladata, facilitator of Jiva's actions. That means you can pray all you want about whatever it is that you're praying. Nothing is going to happen until we put out an action to the field so that the field can then respond back to the actions which I have generated. Okay, so it's the cause of everything. Karnam means the cause. That means that's why we say it's Jagat Karnam because it causes everything. It causes all the rules, all the laws, uh, everything, all the principles of nature. And then Dharma Raja, which is, it controls all laws. And Ahimsa, for example, non-injury, it's built in. That's why we don't like to hurt each other. And that's why if we hurt somebody, we feel guilty. Why? Because Ahimsa, non-injury, is built in. It's, called, it's part of Samanya Dharma. And where does this come from? From Ishwara, who is Dharma Raja. Okay. Now, in the spiritual world, we have a, a phrase called, I am not a doer. You heard this? I am not a doer? Now, see, it depends who's saying, what a, who's saying this phrase, I am not a doer. If an ignorant person says, I am not a doer, what do you think the I am is referring to? The doer. The doer. It's quite ironic. In other words, they're saying the ego is not the doer. But the ego is the doer. But who is doing the doer? Ishwara too. So that means when we say I am not the doer, what that, what that actually means is that I am means satyam, 
consciousness is not the door. So that phrase only applies to one who understands what the I, who they are. See how ironic it is? You can have exactly the same teaching, and yet it's coming from two different mouths, and yet their, their implied meaning is totally different. That's why we've got to be careful when you read certain uh, translations of the Gita or the Upanishads, is that some of them will be coming from a... Uh, from a point of view of, of, of Dvaita, of still believing there is a tunis in the world. So they will interpret the, the chapters or the books in accordance with that misrepresentation. Yeah. That's how tricky it gets. That's why uh, spiritual people can keep searching for s such a long time because they're not even aware that the Guru is sitting on their, you know, their thrones or whatever it is. Even they haven't got the full uh, distinction between Satya and Mitya. Yeah. Okay, so you're not the author, you meaning Jiva, are not the author. If you think about it, if you were the author, then that pretty much means that we'd be getting 24-7 what we want all the time. <laughs> Every day, you'd be happy. Because I asked a couple of sessions ago, put your hand up if you want to suffer. Nobody put their hand up. Implying what? We all, we all relate to joy. We all want to be happy. But if we're really in control, why are we not happy? <laughs> so do we, I mean, so that means what? The real controller is Ishwara too. Okay, so that means, uh, as we'll get to the non-dual attitude of Karma Yoga, which is being equanimous to either yes or no. That means if I get what I want, okay. If I, if I lose what, what I want to protect, okay. It's not in my control anyway because obviously Ishwara is operating. So Ishwara took this away from me and obviously it's my in, in my highest and greatest good because obviously Ishwara knows what's better for me a lot more than I know. So I trust that this takeaway was for my highest and greatest good and I also trust that this offering was and is for my highest and greatest good. Being equilibrious or equanimous to both yes and no. All right, you give me a compliment. All right, you give me an insult. All right, whatever it is. See, the problem and the danger is depending on the yes and avoiding, subtly avoiding the no. It's easy to enjoy the, the appreciation and the gentle reminders, but then what we're doing as a Jiva is training ourselves to subtly avoid or uh, uh, imply that we're denying the other. So that means this attitude of yes or no simply removes that suffering in the inevitable future because you will get a no sooner or later. Okay. Let's go into the scripture. <clears throat> there is also no choice of results because you are not the author of the results. Knowing this, be not attached to inaction. Now we know. The three karmas are operating. You're always, you're always con conducting based on your sanchitta. You're always acting. In other words, don't be attached to not doing nothing. Because then we're just, what? Reserving that sanchitta and it's not playing out. So it's better to let that sanchitta play out. Why? Because then you exhaust it if it's performed in the right attitude. If it's performed in the sense of indulgence, fulfilling my desire, then it ends up feeding the Sanchitta. If it's formed as an offering to Ishwara, knowing that it's not mine, knowing now what Ishwara is, the creator of all the world, then that ends up exhausting the Vasana. Same action, different result, depending on the attitude. That's what Karma Yoga is, a different attitude. Leave the results to the field of action and remain the same when you get what you want and when you and remain the same when you get what you don't want. So this means uh, when we discussed verse two or chapter two, verse forty-eight, we said samat, samatwam yoga uchete, and samat, samatwam means uh, indifference or equanimous or an equipoise of the mind. Uchete means it is said. So uchete, it is said that yoga is the equipoise of the mind. What does that imply? 
That implies an equanimous attitude to yes or no. Only a mind that has a bias for likes moves when it's interfacing with the world. A mind who is totally neutral to yes or no of the world cannot move. And that sums up Samatwam Yoga Uchate. That is yoga. And verse 50 says, Yoga Karmasu Kaushalam. Remember this? Skill in action. And what do we say skill in action means? It means being, first, being deliberate or intentional or mindful or conscious of my actions. Now, it doesn't stop there because I can easily be mindful, conscious, and fully alert robbing a bank. I've done my duty. I've followed the scripture. The cop arrests me and then says, why did you rob the bank? And I say, well, I've been reading the Gita and I've been following verse 50 and it says, Yoga Karmasu Kaushalam, skill in action. I've been performing skill in action. I am doing the Lord's work. And then the cop says, uh, yes, sir, I just happen to be also in a Vedanta class. And it also says part two of the phrase means compassion, which says take the whole into account. Is this affecting the whole in a positive or a negative manner? Is this adding value to the whole or is this subtracting from the whole? This means intention plus compassion. Now, we're going to get into the topic of what compassion means because the word compassion flies around a lot, but we never inquire what compassion is. So now, let's see what it means. Okie dokie. Compassion. Okay, so we've got two views of compassion. Advaita, the non-dual, and the traditional view of compassion. So let's discuss the Advaita view. Compassion means love born out of understanding. What does this mean? Love born out of understanding. Understanding what? Well, there's only one option, understanding the whole, understanding Ishwara. How can I love some, how can I love a thief if I don't understand what motivates that thief to do what they've done? It's easy to love my mom or my dad, but how can I love a thief? Only by understanding the field, Ishwara too. So now let's come to that understanding so that we can actually allow ourselves to have compassion genuinely without just saying have compassion okay and it is acceptance just like this woman she's a little bit chubby but so what her smiley face is on the mirror clearly showing i am absolutely happy with what is okay so now let's arrive to the logic of what compassion is and how can i feel compassion for the thief no more or less than for the saint. Okay, so a jiva finds, a jiva means, a, we're talking about the person, you. A jiva finds themselves innocently in a situation. Is this not what happens to you? You're always innocently exposed to a situation, right? You're innocently driving home. You're innocently just eating. You're innocently saying hi. You're innocently responding to somebody else who says hi to you. That means you are forced to respond to the environment. Is this your experience? You're always responding to your environment. So what? Well, what does that do? It generates karma. Because we just said, agami karma, anything done for the first time, creates sanchitta, and sanchitta has a tendency to express as prarata, prarata right? So that means I have innocently said hi to a lady who was in a, in a bar or in a, in, a, in a Starbucks because she's reading a book and I just happened to be sitting close. I was like, oh, that's an interesting book. Totally innocent. And she totally innocently said, oh, well, here's, here's what the book is about. Let me tell you about the book. We totally innocently got into a conversation. I did not apply tact. She was not intentional. We were just totally human beings. So what happens next? 
Well, I have applied action. She has responded. Karma has generated. That means now it, there's a tendency to repeat this again, either with the same person or in, in a different situation. So that means Agami Karma has been now, first time I've spoken, it's now being transferred to the Sanchita, and then the Sanchita will have a tendency to expose or extrovert itself as Pradapta. Clear so far? Okay. That means I now have a new Vasana in my Sanchita storehouse. So that means the Jiva ends up hence molding itself according to the actions that it has created in response to the environment that it found itself in. Innocently. You were not intentionally in any way. So that means every action done creates karma. Karma has a tendency to repeat itself and you just totally innocently find yourself asking for a date the next day. Or in the case of uh, a person tries out I don't know, drugs or something, totally innocently, they've responded to the environment and said, yes, I want some. And then it's Agami, first time they've tried it out. It's now become Sanchitta and it's going to express itself in the future. And two years later, they're a drug addict. Totally innocent. So the conclusion is you are what you are because of the mechanics that we've just explained according to the logic. And if you could help it, of course, you would have done something by now. But we're not all, you know, we're, we're not, all, look at the world. Is, is the world generally happy? Well, it depends how you look at it. But generally people are what? Getting into entertainment, they are divorcing, marrying, multiple partners. All of these things are being sought as what? As a, a, a to, to add onto me because why? I feel empty. That means that a jiva is totally innocent to its life as a result of the mechanics we, we just explained. Um, so the question is, can you blame yourself for being the way you are? We just done the logic here. Think about it. Totally innocently, at some point, a teenager uh, got into, um, let's say, soccer. They were told, play soccer. And they said, oh, I like soccer. They didn't like soccer before, but now they like soccer. And then soccer has created a tendency to repeat playing soccer. And then in the World Cup, they're on the field. It all started from one little incident couple of years ago. What control do you really have? It's always a yes and a no. It's a tricky one, right? Is, is there a free will vasana? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's free will is um, your nature. As a jiva. Free will just means um, the ability to look at my vasanas and choose whether I want chocolate or whether I want um, a strawberry. Like I said last week, an animal can't do that. Animal can't choose to become a vegetarian or a meat eater. Only a human being can. So vasana uh, free will is defaulted in a human being. That's why we say a human being is the greatest privilege that, that can happen in, in creation. Okay, so now let's give you some examples to demonstrate this logic. A thief can't help it. If they could, they wouldn't violate ahimsa. What do we say? Who likes to suffer? Nobody. Who likes to be stolen from? Nobody. And yet the thief innocently can't help themselves but to steal. Why? We explain the logic. At some point, they were given, uh, they were told by their friend to go and you know, steal that pen in the, in, in the school class. And they took that pen and that created Sanchitta Karma, which then generated into further actions as Prarapta. And two years later, they robbed the bank. How about example B? Oh, by the way, Christ said very beautifully, uh, hate the sin, not the sinner. Why? Because the sinner is innocent. We just explained, the sinner is Brahman, everything is consciousness. 
the sinner innocently accumulated this program as a result of their exposure to the, to the environment and now just innocently playing, they can't help it. Do you see now why we can actually have compassion for the good and the bad? It's nobody's fault. How about the perfect me? We all have an idea of the perfect me uh, as a jiva. Like, what is the perfect me? And how I should be kind, accepting, patient, uh, loving, generous. I should be more smiley, less, you know, less this, more that. We all have an idea in our heads, a fantasy that we create as a result of our conditioning. But in real life, we totally contradict our good opinions about how I should perform. It happens all the time. And this then causes us to conclude, well, I'm not then loving. I'm unworthy. Something is wrong with me. But is that true? Considering we just explained the logic of why you are the way you are. It can't be true. Because you are just simply doing things as a result of the exposure of the environment that you were put in. Did you choose what neighborhood to grow up, grow up in? Did you choose what kind of friends to have? Did, did you even crawl out of your mother's womb? Or you were expelled out? Did you find your mother's nipples? or Did you like go, oh, okay, did you detect, okay, I need to go and suck on that. Or did they put you on the mother's nipples? So that means that from day one, as a baby, we had zero control what to be exposed to, where, to, whom, uh, to what kind of environment to be born in. We were just innocently in wherever we were in. And as a result of that has caused us jivas to be who we are today. So it cannot be your fault because you did no choosing. Who gets born, pops out of the mother's womb and goes, you know what, I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to be uh, ignorant and I'm going to suffer. That's what I'm going to do. Huh? Nobody. Nobody would do that. You had no choice. Total, total blank slate. And just all of this stuff was just dumped onto the poor child, depending on the parents and the environment. And now the child is just innocently playing that out. So that means the only way out of suffering, the only way out of suffering is not by fixing these issues, even though there's nothing wrong with fixing them in terms of, uh, you know, replacing them with more positive behaviors, is to dissociate from the false character, I. Because none of that is yours. That's the only way out. That means those who spend years and years in personal development, well, good luck. I mean, you know, I've done that. It's, 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 it, there's always more to clean. There's always more to purify. There's always more to uh, be a better person. It never ends. <laughs> All right, so uh, the third example is a jiva seeker, a spiritual seeker, and they have, of course, an idea or a fantasy about what a, a jivan mukti is, what an enlightened person is, and so what happens is they project that idea onto the person. So that means you could have a, a, a fully qualified teacher sitting right in front of them, and because of their projection, their idea of what an enlightened person looks like, they speak in a certain manner, they look in a certain manner, they dr they're dressed in a certain manner, they, uh, they have a certain, they're, they're married or they're divorced. You know that one? That's a big one. Oh, you're married. Oh, obviously, you need a woman or you need a man, so you cannot be enlightened. All of these projections get dumped onto these, these, uh, onto these uh, gurus. And it compromises the seeker's own success because their dislike says, I do not like what I see. I need to move on until I find someone who, uh, who matches my criteria of a Jivan Mukti. Kind of sounds unfair, doesn't it? See how, how long the search can go on? That means Vasana is such a, 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 a problem. Because it doesn't allow the jiva to sit down and just listen. It's got its own ideas about how the course or how the teaching or how or what, what the truth should be like. So that's why in uh, Vedanta we have stage one, Shravana. Shravana means listening for around five years. 
and uh, being able to, and that takes a lot of effort if you think about it, just listening, putting our own teachings aside, <coughs> our own ideas about the world, just putting it aside. Okay, so if it doesn't conform, no compassion. If it conforms, then there is compassion. And uh, therefore, the conclusion is conditional love. I love you because you conform to my likes, to my raga, and I don't love you because you do not conform to my dislikes. Vasana drives the jiva, tells them what to do, to whom to associate with, to whom to listen, to whom to not to listen. Has nothing to do with reality, only their own, their own program, their own raga, like or desire and dvesha repulsion and it modifies their experience constantly so that's why um, we need to just relax and listen and it takes a lot of effort to do that okay so now the traditional view of um, compassion is is we think that uh, compassion is doing you know, we, we see this often in Buddhism, like we think it's an act of kindness or it's an act of uh, being, having a sense of responsibility and, and helping others when the time is necessary. It's got nothing to do with doing. Do you know why? Well, first of all, compassion is the nature of you, love. Because satyam is understanding. It's understanding love. So now, how does that have a need to do something? Does that not imply that what motivates a doer to do or help another? What motivates that? Vasanas. And what, and, and, and what does that do? It reinforces the doer, the ego. That means in the traditional view of compassion, the person exercising compassion inflicts love onto another jiva and justifies that as I'm being compassionate. You know what that does? It severs or it cuts the cord of their own swadharma. It interferes with their swadharma. And I then justify, I, I, I wanted to help them. No, they didn't ask for help. They don't need your help. It's Ishwara you're talking to. Ishwara is going to take care of them. If they're going to be taken care of, they will be taken care of. But then the jiva's own likes and dislikes in the name of compassion comes and says, Oh, you need some help. No, you don't. They will get the help when they get the help. And it won't be in the way that you expected. So it reinforces the door. Because if you think about it, compassion builds a lot of wisdom and virtue. So then the jiva identifies and says, Well, I am being virtuous. I am being, uh, I have wisdom. So that causes then the jiva to exercise that virtue and, and wisdom. What does that do? Reinforces the jiva. Door. And we're trying to get rid of the door. So it defeats the purpose. How about falling in love? Here's a common one. I love you. Two, because I love you, I have the right to criticize you and tell you how you should and shouldn't be. Happens all the time. What does this do? It violates the primary law. It's a violation of ahimsa. Because we're not accepting them to be the way they are. So it's a violation of samanya dharma. And we justify that as... I care about you. I have compassion for you as my partner. So here's how you should be in accordance with my own likes and dislikes. <laughs> they have nothing to do with you. They have their own path. They have their own swadharma. They have their own karma. They have zero to do with you. That's why we said from number one here, compassion is letting them be exactly how they are. That means the only purpose of a partner is just to accept them the way they are, period. Not to change them, not to tell them what to do, how they should be, how they should uh, you know, uh, dress differently or speak differently or be different in, with their friends. Nothing to do with it. That is all a violation of um, primary law, ahimsa, injury. 
So you can see how these uh, mistakes, these false notions, they pervade in the society and we innocently exercise them and then we justify that in the name of love, compassion. Because we all want to preserve that good opinion about ourselves. But ignorance as a result causes us not to see that even though we're trying to do our best, we're actually simultaneously causing damage. Simultaneously. Law number one or rule number one, get educated. Because without education, how can one exercise compassion? That's why we need education in society. Because people are trying to do the best they can, but they don't have the access to um, this, so they, so they make a mistake. So this cycle of samsara just keeps going on. All right, so... In reality, therefore, it's a violation of ahimsa. It's condition. That's what conditional love is. You do this for me, and I will love you. If you don't do this for me, then I will not love you. And you know what the problem with that is? Because the two partners are together, let's say partner A, and we have partner B. Partner A knows that partner B depends on partner A's love. So they what? They end up manipulating unknowingly or knowingly by asking partner B to do the duty of partners A swadharma, which has nothing to do with partner B's swadharma. But partner B doesn't have the courage to say no, because if they say no, they won't get the love which they depend on from partner A. So they end up what? Violating their own swadharma in order to get some love and help the other while simultaneously violating their own path. It's kind of sad, isn't it? <laughs> so that means a relationship can be both the greatest thing, but it's simultaneously, if it's run by a form of ignorance, it can be just probably just the most destructive. Um, it just continues the, the paradigm of ignorance. Yeah, so we're not saying, um, see the Buddhists will say, you know, celibacy and all this. Um, we don't agree with that. Celibacy has nothing to do with reality. It, it's, it's like, what's the difference between uh, an, an, moving my hand and, and uh, kissing? A, what's the difference? It's an action. But what pervades all actions? Satyam. It had nothing to do with what? Doing certain things and avoiding certain things. Nothing. That means the only job for a jiva is to get educated, keep the eye on Satyam, I am, and let everything else be run by Ishwara 2. Surrendering to Ishwara 2. That's the summary of it. All right. Questions? So you don't get to decide in a relationship what might be adamic or beyond what's right for that other person. You, you have no say in that. Uh, it's a dynamic. Relationships are a dynamic. And uh, yes, and see, there's, one's got to keep their goal in mind, their vision. What is my vision? If my partner is, is consistently uh, causing me to sway away from my vision, then it's my duty to step up and say, look, that's what you want. That's not, what, that's not what's important for me. So there is a yes and a no, but it's not disrespecting them, but at the same time, uh, respecting yourself and them simultaneously. This non-dual attitude of getting what you want, that's okay. Not getting what you want, that's okay either. It's called yoga. That's yoga. Desire-based actions, desire-based actions are inferior to those performed in the karma yoga spirit. Why? I gave the answer a couple minutes ago. An action based on desire is inferior to an action, same action, but done in a karma yoga spirit. Why is that? Why is karma yoga more superior to action, even though it's the same action. Because karma yoga exhausts the vasana. A soul desire oriented action reinforces the vasana. That means nothing changes. 
we're not telling you, you know, perform a certain ritual and go out and, you know, pray and say certain chants and so on. We do exactly what we do with a different attitude. We're going to investigate what this attitude is. Take refuge in this attitude. Now the ego is asking, why? Why should I? So now let's address that. In other words, why should I take uh, refuge in the attitude of karma yoga? Why should I live the rest of my life? Why should you live the rest of your life in the spirit of karma yoga? Let's answer that. Durena hyavaram karma bodhi yoga dhanam jaya bodhau sharanam andicca kripana pala hetavaha Okay, the direct translation is uh, karma, uh, avaram, inferior, uh, durena, by far. So, action is by far inferior to what? To buddhi yoga dhanam jaya, to the wisdom of yoga, in this case, karma yoga. Uh, anvicha, uh, Therefore, take Sharanam refuge in this knowledge of yoga. Kripanaha, despicable are those whose hetavaha motives are in pala, in their fruits. Despicable are those whose motives are of what's in it for me. What am I going to gain after I perform this action? Despicable are those, says the Lord. Therefore, the di direct translation is, uh, action is inferior by far to the wisdom of yoga. Uh, therefore, take refuge in this yoga or this wisdom. Despicable are those whose motives are in the fruits of their action. Okay, so now let's see what Chin Maya says. Uh, this comes from, Holy, uh, from the Holy Gita. Once again, I'm referring to this reference manual. It's uh, highly technical to see what, um, what they're going to say. So unselfish work, unselfish work performed in a spirit of dedication and egoless surrender. Dedication, egoless surrender is the secret, the secret method of exhausting our vasanas store. Such a mind alone, purged clean, can reflect the self clearly and come to discover the eternal Godhood I am. Unselfish work performed without the uh, sense of what am I going to get out of it. That's what this phrase, uh, verse 49, is saying. Okay, so now let's um, go to the next part and introduce us and to answer this question, why? Why should I take refuge in this uh, selfless service attitude for the rest of my life? Thy right is to work only, but never to its fruits. That's the instruction. The fruit of an action, when one understands properly, is not anything different from the action itself. That means the, re the reaction is not different from the action, because the action is the reaction, because everything is happening right now. So every action is causing a reaction simultaneously. An action in the present, right now, when conditioned by a future time, appears as the fruit of the action. In fact, the action ends or fulfills itself only in its reaction. And the reaction is not anything different from the action. Action fuels the reaction. Reaction feedback loops the action. The action then responds to the reaction and then continues acting, causing a reaction to feedback loop to the action. It's a cycle. 
All right, so an action in the present defined in terms of the future moment is its reaction. Therefore, to worry over and get ourselves preoccupied with the anxieties for the rewards of our actions, what's in it for me, that is, is to escape from the dynamic present and to live in a future that is not yet born. Not yet born. In short, the Lord's advice here is to call to man, not to a woman, not to waste his or her present moment in fruit, fruitless dreams and fears, but to bring his or her best, all the best in them to the present and vitally live every moment, the promise being that the future shall take care of itself, because Ishwara is animating the whole field, and shall provide the karma yogin, yogin is the one that performs karma yoga, with achievements divine and accomplishments supreme. So now that we see the, the answer to why I should engage in this attitude of karma yoga, being, equal, uh, being equanimous to yes and a no, is that starting to become clear now? Because if, if, it's a, if I want something, then what, what, am I, what am I saying if I want something? If I want something to happen out of my action, what am I saying? I'm saying what? First of all, that I'm separate from everyone else, that, I have, that, that, I'm, that I'm the boss here. How arrogant is that? Do I animate the wind? Do I cause the weather to, to be the way that it does? Do I cause my heart to beat? Do I even move all and fire all the neurons in my brain and cause the dendrites to connect and cause this language to be understood? Do I do anything? No. So that means the surrender to Ishwara is the greatest um, mature, progressive spiritual decision that a jiva can uh, come to out of the sheer understanding that Ishwara, the field, is animating the whole show. And the best thing that we can do is just, just, just release ourselves to that great intelligence, which is taking care of the entire universe. That's Karma Yoga. Constantly keeping our minds on Ishwara, knowing that Ishwara too is the field, the one that animates the entire show. I think I gave an example once, uh, going to a party, and how many circumstances actually determine your conversation, the kind of conversation you have at a party? Like if it's a cold day, you're going to go inside the house, as opposed to going outside, you're probably going to be more extroverted outside than inside, more introverted. The conversations inside are going to be probably a lot more closer because you're probably conscious of other people hearing your conversation. Therefore, that's going to determine how loud you speak. If you go outside, you're going to have the sun, you're probably going to take your shirt off, someone's going to think you look quite uh, you know, handsome or something, and that's going to lead to a different conversation. So, so many circumstances, and the wind blows, the wind's too strong, so I'm going to go inside the house. So many circumstances are occurring every moment, and that's all Ishwara. And we're surrendering to that intelligence. All right. Those who do not, those who do actions only for results are misers. That summarizes what we just spoke. The, yo the yoga attitude neutralizes your likes and dislikes. Therefore, commit yourself to karma yoga. Discretion in action. Discretion means to uh, behaving or speaking in such a way as not to provoke or invoke drama, let's say. That's discretion. So, that in other words, Think about someone who is like just totally, uh, f f what's the word, Fla flame, flame buoyant, ex ex exuberant, and they just cause all the heads to turn. Why? How, the person was totally in their world, and now suddenly they got forced to turn and look at somebody else, snapping them out of their own contemplation. See, this happens all the time, and it's so innocent. Even when the ladies, you know, put short skirts, it just turns all these heads and, and uh, totally interrupts the mindset of the, of the individual. And it's, so, and it's so innocent. That's why I say ignorance is sexy. 
Anything that's sex is ignorance. <laughs> Therefore, commit yourself to Karma Yoga. Having given up the results of action, the wise free themselves from the bondage of birth and death and accomplish the result that is free of suffering. When your intellect has removed its delusion regarding what is actually gained through action, you will become dispassionate concerning both ignorance and knowledge and firmly established in the self. Verse 253. Shruti vipratipanate tada yogam awapsyasi. When your intellect remains not confounded, unbedazzled, unconfused, unmoved, unshaken by the Shruti, by the scripture, by the knowledge of creation, and you being so firmly established into yourself as yourself then you have achieved yoga slash self-realization which means that whether there is ignorance present or knowledge present because I am so firmly established in the self it doesn't touch me that is yoga a self-realized jivan mukti all right, so uh, next time we come together, we will continue Karma Yoga. And a very interesting, important part that will satisfy Gareth, having asked me once when you were sitting here, what does an enlightened person look like and how do we know? So the scripture gives us a checklist. So you can check this against your, your behavior, yourself. See, there's nothing that we miss out. So uh, we're going to cover that. And it's very important because it lets you know where you're at in this journey. All right, and this is, um, yeah, super. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramaya, Sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchi dukha bhag bhavet om shanti 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 hi. May all be happy, may all be free from illness, may all behold good things, may no one suffer. All knowledge is then uh, really valuable even though, even if it's doesn't really lead to any way if it's meaningless in a way. If it's mitya, it's still That's right. You know, as long as you, you That's okay. Action. Yeah, good good point. Um, you see I said at the beginning that action only reinforces action. But how is how is knowledge separate from that? Because learning is also an action, right? Like when you're learning, that's that's another action. But what is an action? It reinforces ignorance. So now we have a little problem. Now we're saying we're learning here about who, who, who I am, but at the same time I'm reinforcing ignorance. No, you're not. You know why? Because the purpose of knowledge, this is the answer to your question, is to remove ignorance. I'll give you a metaphor. Okay, there's a secretary, and the secretary in the office is uh, shuffling her papers. And uh, she gets a phone call. And just before she got the phone, she was writing a document. So she quickly puts the pen on her ear to pick up the phone call. So she gets into a really deep conversation, two hours in the phone call. And then she puts the phone down. And because she was so immersed in the phone call, she totally forgot where her pen is. So now she applies action, looking around everywhere, on the shelf, underneath the chair. She gets crazy frustrated. She's looking everywhere. She reads, um, you know, she's reading books. She goes to yoga sessions, you know, to transcend this ignorance of, of her trying to find what she's trying to find. She does all of these things until somebody walks in and says, the pen is on your ear. So what does that mean? Did any action help her? No. 
What was the was it an action problem or was it an ignorance problem? What was her problem was ignorance. So what? She needed somebody to point out to her that what she was seeking, she already had all along. So the point of self-knowledge is to remove the false notions which tell me that I am not already who I actually am. That's why self-knowledge works. It's as good as somebody pointing out to you, hey, look, you already are what you're seeking. And let me show you how that is possible by how? Removing the false notions which we have accumulated from day one of being born. And we remove these false notions and what remains is something that you've already had from the beginning, which you already are eternally, the self. So that means the answer is knowledge, purpose is to remove ignorance. One that, once that is done, you can throw knowledge away. Because what is knowledge the realm of mitya, what does that have to do with satya? Huh? So Vedanta is a throwaway, basically. You know that story when the lion's walking and the lion steps on the nail, on a thorn, and the lion's you know, crying and he's bleeding, he's gonna bleed to death, and then the man's walking by and the lion asks the man, never mind how the lion can actually ask a person, it's a story. So the lion asks the man, can you please help me? Um, I'm bleeding to death. And the man agrees and he takes another thorn, another thorn, and he, uh, he uh, uh, punctures it and presses the, uh, the, the thorn in the paw, pushes it out. And then the young man throws the second thorn away. Similarly, Vedanta is a thorn to push out the thorn of ignorance. And when you pushed out the thorn of ignorance, you throw Vedanta away. It has nothing to do with you. You are free of knowledge.